What's up, Eagles Nation? What's going on, NFL World? How you doing, division rivals? This is Stephen Heider with Gate City Sports Channel, the sports channel where the cerebral NFL fan comes for about 10 minutes of daily content. All right, guys. Um, hope everyone is enjoying your weekend. I hope everyone is, you know, maybe doing a little cooking out, spending some time with their family, you know, enjoying this Veteran Day weekend. Uh, for all y'all that have served, thank you guys for your service. I'm in that category myself, guys. And um, look, let's get to some content today, guys. This is what I want to talk about. We've been diving deep into this whole ordeal about what is going on with the production from the wide receiver positioning. We've covered possibilities in terms of free agent signings, waiver wire claims we could have made, trade deadline claims we could have made. And you know what? We came out of all this talk and all this discussion with one player, Jordan Matthews who I do think is going to help this football team. But I think a lot of us anticipated maybe we would make a Jordan Matthews signing alongside of another player like J.J. Nelson, but that didn't materialize so far. So today what I want to talk about is, as the roster sits today, with the only really significant addition we're making being Jordan Matthews and possibly getting J.J. Ortega-Whiteside more playing time, what do we do in terms of offensive formation, so personnel packages, what do we do in terms of the play calling to make things a little more unique? And then what are we going to do in terms of how Doug Peterson can, can get this team to push itself with limited, you know, skilled players out there and take advantage of the guys we do have? So today's discussion, let's dive deep into the analytics and let's talk about projections going into these last seven games into the playoffs. Sanders bursting through the rookie from Penn State. All right. That was a hell of a run by Miles Sanders. Um, it's been a long time since we had a kid that can go through a hole like that with that kind of speed and that kind of agility and really, really put us in good positioning. All right, guys. So let's talk about let's talk about this offensive scheme and let's talk about the utilization of players within this play calling. So we already know we're going to, generally speaking, have five offensive linemen unless we're in 13-man personnel where we bring in a sixth guy generally is a tight end, basically. With that said, in a gen general sense, that's leaving you five skilled position players to make an impact because obviously Carson's being the quarterback, you know, outside of the quarterback. What we're looking at, and I'm going to break down how the Eagles utilize personnel packages here in a few seconds, guys, but what we're looking at is primarily a grouping of about seven guys who were touching the ball with consistency. Or I shouldn't say touching the ball because this is the wrong way of expressing it. Seven guys who were getting snaps with consistency. And let me point these out to you guys. So, Nelson Aguilar, 577 snaps in this offense, all right? Which accounted for 89% of all offensive plays. You heard that correctly, guys. The next gentleman on our list is Zach Ertz at 549 snaps, which accounted for roughly. 85% of all offensive snaps. If you guys haven't caught on to this, there was roughly 650 snaps taken so far this season. The next person on our list is Alshon Jeffrey with 420 offensive snaps, which accounts for about 65% of all offensive snaps. The next player on our list would be Mac Hollins at 379 snaps roughly 58% of all offensive snaps. After Mac Hollins, the guy who was basically serving as our fifth in this rotation is Dallas Goddard with essentially averaging 38 snaps a game. And he was in on exactly, I apologize guys, 343 offensive snaps, roughly 53% of all offensive snaps. Then we had Jordan Howard, with 277 offensive snaps, accounting for roughly 43% of all offensive plays. And then Miles Sanders with 243 offensive snaps, which roughly accounted for 37 and a half, or if you're going to round up, 38% of all offensive plays. If you're telling me that getting Mac Collins out of this lineup isn't going to improve us, I highly disagree. This guy was in on nearly 60% of all offensive snaps. He had one reception, guys, over the last six games. Not even, I'm sorry, he didn't even have a reception. Let me rephrase that. He had one target over the last six games. 
but he's playing almost 60% of all snaps. Yeah, guys, this is a big deal. This is a major upgrade. Now what we're going to get into is now that we can move Matt Collins out of the lineup more, where he's not going to count for so many snaps, we can have this discussion basically now, who's going to fill that void? Who's going to be the guy that comes in now and fills the void? And that, I think, gets you into a, a much deeper conversation about the Eagles in terms of offensive formations and how we utilize offensive formations and then what we're going to do in the future with those. Now, this is what I'll tell you guys. If you guys want to go through and you guys want to learn how I pull out and, and I find information like this, there are several sources you can use. I used Roto Wire to pull my offensive snaps just so that way there was consistency across the board. So I will tell you, everyone's going to pretty much come up with a figure of 650 snaps, but some of these different analytics companies might have, you know, where I said, where Rotowire said Howard had 277 offensive snaps, you know, another company might say he had 282, but they're all going to say, roughly, they're going to say, everyone, not roughly, everyone's going to say 650 total snaps, and then you're going to argue over three or four snaps, which isn't going to change the percentage points drastically, guys. So. Let's dive deep, guys, into today's conversation, which is about offensive personnel groupings. I think most of us here are pretty well aware of the two formations the Eagles use with regular consistency. 11-man personnel. For some of you guys that aren't familiar with this stuff means, 11-man personnel just means we're marching three wide receivers onto the football field with a tight end and a running back. We, generally speaking, run 60, so far this year, we've run 63% of our offense through 11-man personnel. The next highest offensive personnel grouping that the Eagles have utilized has been the 12-man personnel. For some of you guys that are wondering what that means, one running back, two tight ends, two wide receivers. And roughly that's accounted for 35% of the Eagles' offensive production. So, believe it or not, that accounts for the majority of what's going on. You got some slight use between the 21-man personnel. We've had three plays run. This is what they've said. Three plays run out of 21 man personnel, which is accounted for roughly 1% of offensive production. We've had less than 1%, one total play, they said, from 13 man. Guys, I really want to look some of this up because I felt like we were in 13 man more than just one play, but I could be wrong. But I could have swore I, I remember hearing different, I, I remember hearing Big V, I, I swear, check in more than once a, as a tight end. But I'd have to go really through it and really watch the film. So maybe they missed it. Maybe it's been three plays instead of one play, but still, you guys get the general point of what they're saying. Two-man personnel. For you guys aren't you guys know what 13 man is, right? 13 man is essentially one back, one running back, one tight end. Or I'm sorry, one running back, one wide receiver, three tight ends. Two-man personnel is three wide receivers and two tight ends. And the Eagles have one play, they said one play accounted for that, less than one percent, one play total. And then the zero man personnel, which is just basically emptying out your backfield. Okay. And one total play there. So, the Eagles have been primarily this, this football season 11 and 12 man personnel. The question now becomes are we going to see the Eagles maybe switch towards a more dominant physical run based football team? And I want to throw some, some teams out here for you and I want to run down what they do because the Eagles, believe it or not, the Eagles are in the middle of the pack when it comes to 11 man personnel. We're a little more creative than other teams are. I'm going to give you some, some numbers here just to show you. Dallas, 77% of its offense comes out of 11-man personnel. The Giants, 79% of their offense comes out of 11-man personnel. The Redskins, 80% of their offense comes out of the 11-man personnel. Contrast that to the Eagles, 63%. You guys see what I'm saying here. Now, I'm going to run through other teams that like to get physical, like to get creative with personnel packages, and don't heavily rely on 11-man personnel as much as other teams. The first team I want to start with, guys, is San Francisco, which runs 56% of its offense out of 11-man personnel. Past that, it runs 25% of its offense out of 12-man personnel. And then it runs roughly about 13% of its offense out of 21-man personnel. Uh, I don't know if I've mentioned 21-man personnel to you guys before, but it's two running backs, one tight end, two wide receivers. Okay, 12-man, you guys already know that. Two wide receivers, two tight ends, one back. All right. Oakland. Oakland runs 58% of its offense through the 11-man personnel package. 
It runs 23% of its offense through the 12-man personnel package. It runs 10% of its offense through the 13-man personnel package. It runs 6% of its offense through the 21-man personnel package. And then it runs 4% of its offense out of the 22-man personnel package. Guys, Oakland likes to get physical. They are constantly using two tight end, three tight end, two back, two tight end, two back, one tight end sets. They like to get physical. They like to get big with teams. Baltimore. Baltimore has run 52% of its offense through the 11-man personnel package. 12 men has accounted for 29% of its offensive personnel package. 13 men, 6%. 21 men, 5%. Another team that likes to get big and likes to run at you. New England. New England likes to run roughly 57% of its offense through 11-man personnel package. 16% through 13-man, 12% through 10-man, and then 10% through 20-man. So a little nuance here, guys. A little shocking that New England doesn't use 12-man as much as you would think. It's more of a primary 13-man, three tight ends on the field. It does like to spread you out, though, in 10-man. So it will go in a 10-man set with four wide receivers and a running back. And it also likes to hit you with 20-man personnel, which is essentially Two backs, two running backs, three wide receivers. So New England is very balanced in that it can spread you out in 11 man, 20 man, and 10 man, but it can also come at your heart and your soul at 13 man. Okay. Minnesota. Minnesota is another team that likes to play physical. 29%. It is literally the team that utilizes 11 man personnel the least. 29% of all of its offensive production comes out of the 11-man personnel. 34% comes out of 12-man personnel. 23% out of 21-man personnel. 7% out of 13-man personnel. And 6% out of 22-man personnel. Put shortly, Minnesota likes to get physical with you more than likes to spread you out. Guys, we can see here the Eagles are closer to these teams in blueprint. We're still a little different. Our skill position players are a little different than some of these other teams. I don't think most of these teams can even hope to, to throw out there what we can throw out there in terms of the skill set of our tight ends and running backs. Some can. I mean, don't get me wrong. Dalvin Cook from Minnesota, great player. Uh, Minnesota, even though it's only utilizing a two wide receiver set, when it can put Thielen out there, and it can, you know what I'm saying, when they can put their two wide receivers out there, they're very dangerous. San Francisco, Scott Kittle at the tight end position. New England can utilize a 12-year-old boy and, and make him into a star. Baltimore has a very dynamic quarterback, has a very dynamic player in Hollywood Brown, so their offense is very unique. It uses um, Ingram out there. I mean, they, they have a very unique offense as well. So if we're talking about this idea of the Eagles and us re-imaging ourselves, we have to look at who we've been utilizing in this offense and how we cut them out. I want to switch gears, guys. I want to go back to the Eagles. I want to talk to you guys for a second here. If we're talking about changing things in the second half of the football season, I'm assuming what a lot of us are talking about is a heavier reliance on 12, 13, and 21-man personnel with maybe a little bit of mix and a couple plays here and there in 22-man personnel. So obviously that means that we would pull even slightly more from 11-man personnel. With that said, if you really look at the way we're utilizing these players, I can show you some weird tendencies we have here. For instance, roughly 53% of Zach Ertz's snaps come from a tight formation, 12-man personnel, essentially, or 13-man, okay? And he plays the slot roughly about 42%, 41.5% to 42% of the time he's in the slot. Now, if you contrast that with Dallas Goddard, literally 75% of snaps from Dallas got to come out of the tight formation, 12, 13 man type personnel packages. Okay. Why? Dallas Goddard has proven to be a very, very good blocking tight end. He's played roughly 22% out of the slot. Now, Dallas Goddard's really only been in the backfield twice. And Ertz has really only come out of the backfield five times himself. But I will say this you want to get creative? Put Goddard or Ertz in the backfield with one of these backs. 
start getting creative with some of the play design. I think that could be like pieces we could use there. But it does show you Tennessee that we are much more likely to utilize Ertz in the slot than we are Goddard, and Goddard's much more likely to be placed tight, even though we still use Ertz in that fashion for black, blocking assignments or chipping assignments before going out. Uh, in terms of outside versus slot performance on the wide receivers, guys, it's a, just a, it's a continuous sad story of Mac Hollins. The guy had the speed. The guy had the height, okay? He had the physical capabilities of this combination of speed and height. He didn't know what he was doing on the field, and it sucks because the Eagles underneath Peterson have really liked to move the Z receiver positioning a lot. I'm going to give you a for instance here. So Matt Collins played in 379 offensive snaps. 163 of them came out of the slot. 198 of them came from the outside. Nine of them came out of the backfield, and three of them came in tight. You can see they like to move the Z receiver position out a lot. As you know, in reverse here, guys, if you look at Alshon, Alshon has played 420 offensive snaps. Of those 420, only 97 came out of the slot. So he will be utilized in the slot here and there. But roughly speaking, he's going to be on the outside, and he's only really been used four times in tight formations. Aguilar, 577 snaps, only 105 of them came on the outside. Aguilar's not an outside receiver, guys. He's just not. He can be utilized some, though, in, in some of those bunches and tight formations. That is something they do like to do with Aguilar, so that's more where his kind of bread and butter is. This is what I'm saying. We can look at this and we can say, how do we improve this football team? Some of this has got to come from the way that we're utilizing some of these players. And we've got to change up the formations a little bit to fit where the talent is. Matt Collins coming off this football field is going to help tremendously. I think we have to find a way of getting J.J. Ortega Whiteside reps. I think Jordan Matthews is going to be an improvement. Jordan Matthews is a guy that, while he's not going to hit the home run ball the way Deshaun Jackson does, he will get deep on you. He will beat you if you let him. He is much more of a threat in that regards than the faster receiver in Matt Collins, which is, it's puzzling, guys. Matt Collins, it, it's it's very disappointing with Matt Collins because he fit the prototypical Z-type receiver you would want to on this Eagles football team. He's fast. He's lengthy. He's got more build and weight to him than you would think. He just didn't know where to be on the football field. He didn't know where to line up. He was running the wrong route trees. Like, it was just getting embarrassing. So that's what we're looking at here, guys. That's what's going on. My, for, my prediction is we are going to see a slight decrease in 11-man personnel. I would say we'll start seeing the Eagles probably over the last seven games, instead of being in about 63% 11-man personnel, I wouldn't doubt if we start ticking down 60, 58-ish, you know, 3 to 5 percentage points down. And either utilizing more 12-man personnel, utilizing more 21-man personnel, or 13 and 22. That would be my prediction, is that we're going to become a little more diverse of an offense. And I want to show you an article that talks about Doug Peterson and offensive formations that I read in getting prepared for this conversation today. Okay. This article is titled, Eagles Don't Want to Be Limited by Offensive Formations Anymore, written by Nick Fiaro of The Morning Call on July 28th, 2017. Right around the beginning of training camp, essentially, guys, of 2017. The Eagles clearly want to be able to use formations and personnel packages without being limited to pass or run. They want to dictate what personnel packages opponents respond with, and they want to keep from being read until after the snap. I don't know about you guys, but that football team that was described in that 2017 article on the EVA training camp back then, I'd like to see that football team in 2019 towards the end of this second half of the season. I, I would love to see a team that's that versatile. I would love to see a team that, that is that um, limitless in terms of formation bases. We, we've got to make the right decisions when it comes to utilization of personnel packages and utilization of personnel within the packages, which has not always been Doug's strong suit at times. Doug's a great, Doug is a great play designer. I'm not going to take that away from him. And Doug really does well at rallying the team. 
But I will admit there are times he makes some pretty sketchy and questionable personnel decisions in packaging. To begin with, I know health has a lot to do with this, guys. But Aguilar being in on 89% of all offensive plays, that's got to change. That's got to come down, down, down. The next guy, Holland, who was in on 58% of all offensive plays. You guys don't realize it, but like I said, you generally get five skilled position players who are going to have major impact on your game. Well, we had Aguilar at 89%, Ertz at 85%, Alshon at 65%, Hollins, number four, Hollins at 58%, and then Goddard at 53 That's not even getting to the sixth and seventh guy, which would be Howard and Sanders. Howard at 43 Sanders at 37 and 38% roughly. In my opinion, we have made improvement during this bye week. Being able to replace some of that 58% production by Hollins and actually having someone who's competent competent enough to warrant more than one target over six games is a major, major difference. Now, what I would like to see is snaps taken away from Aguilar, those snaps filled in by Hollins, given to players such as Jordan Matthews and J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. Look, Goddard, giving him an extra player or two, sure, but he's already 53% of our offense. Ertz is already 85% of our offense. We're already heavy 12 men. That's part of our base. The player in the production that needs to be changed here is Hollins and Aguilar. If we can change those two players' production and get positive results from it, we're going to do well. And for me, there's really only a couple of possibilities to do that. Number one is to utilize more two-back sets with having both Miles Sanders and having uh Jordan Howard on the field at the same time. Hell, I'd even settle for if they want to mix in a few times Darren Sproles with Howard or Sanders in the field. That's still better than some of the other crap we're giving us. I'd like to really limit San uh, I'd like to really limit Darren Sproles, but at the same time, Doug's gonna do Doug. So at least give us the personnel package that could be successful. And then let the player fall where the player falls in terms of productivity. Now, can we turn this around with what we got? I think we can, but like I said, guys, we've got to we've got to do something about this 58% production from Hollins on on the field, and it's it's got to actually not even production. It needs to warrant production at 58% of snaps. Aguilar, 89% of snaps. What has he really given us this year? Those things have got to be changed. We're going to be successful ultimately this season. All right, guys, this is a very long video. I'm going to cut it off at this point. This is what I'll ask you. I just gave you all the numbers. I went through and did a deep dive for you guys on the snap counts, on, on the utilization of formations, and I've given you ideas about where I would make changes not only in the personnel packages, so 21-man, 22-man, 13-man, 12-man, that kind of stuff, but also individual personnel, the players within the packages. So this is what I would like to hear from you. What package would you like to see rolled out more of? What players would you like to see utilized more? That's my question for the day, guys. All right. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And oh, yeah, you know what time it is. E-A-G-L-E-S. Hey, guys, let's talk about this one because I think this is going to be very important over the second half of the season.